All right. I'd like to welcome to the stage our next speaker, Justin. Um, so Justin told me a little bit about his adventures. He's going to talk tonight. He has given um, a very exciting talks about um, exploding zeppelins in the past. And tonight he is going to talk about one of the very first couples to uh, go up in uh, hot air balloons. And they were incredibly intrepid and also possibly crazy. Uh, Justin traveled solo in Egypt, rented a motorcycle, and drove the Valley of Kings and Queens, and then later attended an Eid Fest in a Soviet-style apartment in the outskirts of Cairo. Uh, please welcome Justin to the stage to talk about the early era of ballooning. <laughs> Justin, in your bold red suit, where are you? Oh, there, he there he is, here he goes. My goal was to wear more color than everyone in the audience combined. <laughs> so hi, my name's Justin and I love airships. There we go, perfect. All right, so tonight I'm gonna talk about Sophie and Jean-Pierre Blanchard, balloonist extraordinary. However, our story doesn't start with this couple. Instead, it starts with this couple, couple uh, the Montgolfier brothers, who are French commercial paper manufacturers. And we start with them because in 1783, Joseph discovered the lifting power of hot air by watching his wife, wife's undergarments over the fire. Thanks to watching women's underwear, they built this. A 110 foot diameter, 30 foot high paper balloon fueled by hot air from the fire beneath it that rose to 1,800 meters. This is 1783. Just for reference, 1,800 meters in 1783 is more than nine times higher than the Eiffel Tower, which hadn't been built yet. And it wouldn't be built for a century. All right, so, so then, okay, not to be outdone, Jacques Charles and the Robert brothers have the first manned hydrogen balloon ascent in Paris on December 1st in 1783. Now, this is not notable for one important fact. Half the population of Paris watched this ascent. 400,000 people. So, a few famous people started writing about balloons, and the early aeronauts started to realize an important formula. Chemistry and showmanship equal wonder, crowds, and money. <laughs> Let's get ready to rumble! And so to all of the folks who thought, wanted to make a quick buck, it's on. <laughs> Enter player one. Jean-Pierre Blanchard, born July 4th, 19, uh, 1753, and this is his balloon. Yeah, I'm not kidding. This is a, He actually had oars. He, he thought he was going to be able to row through the air. Uh, he wasn't such a good scientist, but he was a great exhibitionist. And he was also great at promoting his own flights. He, took, he actually suffered a sword wound prior to his first flight, and so he played it up. And then he also plundered. He went to Virgil, and he, coined, he used this phrase, thus one journeys to the stars from the Aeneid, Book 9, line 641, if you want to check it out. <laughs> and the important part here is he inscribed this on his flags, his balloons, and his entrance tickets, which he was sure to sell. Now, he has the first hydrogen balloon flight in October of 1784 in England. And he flew over 75 miles that day. So in January of 1785, he crosses the English Channel. There's a whole 20 minute talk about this flight, so please go and look it up. But the important part is he, as a result of this, he is summoned by the King of France and given an annual pension for being an amazing aeronaut to bring France to the skies. Now, he's making money left, right, and center here. Uh, he had the first balloon flights in Belgium, Germany, the Netherlands, and Poland. The problem he faces, though, is that there are now more and more people entering, entering the balloon market, and it's getting harder and harder to sell tickets. 
People are throwing dogs from balloons because the parachute's just been invented. People are ascending balloons while on a horse. It gets kind of crazy. So what do you do if you need to make a lot of money? You come to America. <laughs> So in 1792, he journeys to America with his balloon, with that logo emblazoned on the side, and where he meets uh, General Thomas Mifflin, the governor of Pennsylvania, Benjamin Franklin, and George Washington, who signs his passport, saying, I am General President Washington. This man is a good man. <laughs> so Washington and the other dignitaries in the Pennsylvania field watch as Blanchard ascends to the skies, and he has a quite successful flight. Uh, and like most successful flights of the era, it ends by him crashing. <laughs> now, he lands outside, uh, he, he crashes into a copse of trees, and he's met by an American farmer with a gun. <laughs> now, uh, so he shows him the note from Washington. He's because, oh, by the way, Jean-Pierre doesn't speak any English. So in French, Washington, Washington, unfortunately, the American can't read. <laughs> so Jean-Pierre does the next best thing, especially if you're French. He offered him some of the wine he brought with him in the balloon. They have a lovely party. Another farmer shows up. This one, fortunately, can read and verifies the note from Washington, and all is resolved. So this is the heroic era. Yes, and he got a little drunk. Uh, so this is the heroic era of ballooning. Uh, he's making money, he's famous, he's drawing crowds. But what happens when ascent to the skies goes from magical to being mundane? When it no longer gets people to pay attention? And like all manias, they do come to an end. So what do you do if you're an older man who's a showman, who's used to bringing in the big crowds, and is losing a spring in their step? <laughs> Enter player two. <laughs> Marie Madeleine Sophie Armand, born 1778, and it's, it's rumored that he saw her in the crowd and noted, I will come back and marry that girl when she is of age. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, he actually was already married with kids. So uh, he actually divorces his first wife in, in pursuit of ballooning. But he and uh, Sophie uh, do get married, and it is a May-December wedding. But let's talk a little about Sophie. She was described in the press at the time as quiet, small, frail, and bird-like abnormally nervous. Among the things she was frightened of were crowds, <laughs> loud noises, horses, and coach travel. <laughs> Not exactly what you want in your balloonist. Right? However, you put her in a balloon and she becomes a fucking badass. <laughs> she becomes confident, commanding, a natural entertainer, a provoking exhibitionist, and daring to the point of recklessness. Now, don't take my word for it. Take a rendering of the balloon basket she went up in. This is actually to scale. Other balloonists were surprised at her lunacy. So, oh, balloonacy, there we go. Thank you, there, okay, yeah, we have toast to that one. Well, well done, well done. So, so they have their first joint flight in 1804, and her daring escapades in the balloon brings in the crowds. And by all accounts, they are quite happy together. They have dozens of flights every year until 1808, when Jean-Pierre Blanchard suffers a heart attack in the balloon, and he falls from the basket over 50 feet, and after 15 years and 67 flights in 1808, he dies. So, what is Sophie to do? She doesn't stop. <laughs> she develops, she is flying so much, she develops rivalries with other balloonists. Right? Uh, many of her flights, she, she flew so high, she passed out due to the high altitude. Uh, 
In 1811, she stayed o uh, airborne for over 14 hours to avoid a hailstorm because she was flying above it. Uh, she became the chief air ministry in ballooning for this guy. She ascent for his wedding in 1810 to Marie Louise, and she was the aeronaut of official festivals. Oh, in 1812, she crosses the Alps. Not on an elephant. You're right, you're right, in style on a balloon. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and then when Louis, Louis the 18th gets thrown back, thrown back she, becomes she becomes the official aeronaut of the restoration. So, she, so this, she, this is a lady who is a bad, 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 bad right? right? Now, now in, 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 in 1919, there's a massive party in Paris. Paris. Uh, uh, multitudes of people assemble around the balloon. A cannon, a cannon, a cannon, a cannon, a cannon, a signal, a departure. The balloon rises, sings sound of music, shouting, shouting people. And one of her rival balloonists notices some lights on his balloon. And she said, oh, no, 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 I bring fireworks for <laughs> her. So a so wire a rope, 10 yards long, is suspended, is suspended from her carriage. From carriage. And, it, and, it, and the bottom, bottom is a broad disk of wood that has all these fireworks. And the descriptions of the time say a rain of gold and thousands of stars fell from the carriage as it descended. And so everyone is stunned and ooing and aahing and the initial fireworks display peters out. And then a second light appears in the middle of the carriage, and then at the top of the carriage, and then there's a giant gout of flame coming out of the top of the carriage. What had happened is that Sophie had a second package of fireworks she was on, with a little parachute she was going to throw out. In the process of lighting it, she didn't light the envelope on fire. Some of the hydrogen gas had actually been squeezed out the mouth of the balloon, and it had been mixing with the air outside the balloon. So the fire actually caught the air which then swung up and around the envelope and then caught that nice, lovely fuel-air mixture above the balloon's envelope. So she tried to put out the fire, and when she was unable to do it, she doesn't panic. She sits down and calmly waits because she knows that the, the hydrogen is not burning off too fast, and in fact, the carriage slowly descends into the Montmartre Quarter. Sadly, her tiny slip of a carriage catches the top of the roof, and she is pitched two stories onto the cobblestones below. She watched her husband die after falling from a balloon. She kept going, because in ballooning, she found a thing that turned her into her best self. And so I ask you, what would it be like for you if you found that thing and you didn't let it go? And what would it be like? And I would encourage you to find that thing and seize it and do it so well that when you die, they put it on your gravestone. So here, here's a toast to Sophie Blanchard, ballooning badass. Thank you. So, this was Justin's third talk. And we have a tradition here, which means, Justin, would you become a fellow of Odd Salon? Yes, I would. Welcome to the fellowship. Justin is now the first fellow of 2017. Thank you. There will be pins. Okay, um, real quick, um, I'm gonna, we're, we ha now have a mountain of these things. Everyone got them in during intermission. Okay, so uh, we have another grade school recollection here. I once did the dead man's drop from the bars in grade school. I let go with my legs too early. I think we have all done this. I knocked myself out again. Um, when I came to, I got up and went about my day as one does in grade school. I think, I feel like we have all in fact done that and as the, the like recess person came to find us, we just sort of got up and wandered off. Um, this one is, um, I fought in the ring, kickboxing. My opponent, when touching gloves, said, you're going down, but I kicked the crap out of that guy. <laughs> Hi, Matt. Um, I rode a motorcycle across Europe in winter, in the worst winter that Europe had seen in 10 years. Um, hi, Trey. <laughs> Um, I clung to the back of a moving car driven by crackheads who had robbed my apartment, screaming until the cops arrived. That's good. 
Um, I have a bad habit of hiking and snowshoeing by myself. Once in the Sandia Mountains, I got my legs stuck in a tree well while snowshoeing. After trying to work it out from the tree well, deeper than my height, laughing out loud, staying, uh, stating, this is not how you die, I worked myself free 20 minutes later. I then decided to try another route and snowshoed for two more hours. Hi, Shannon. <laughs> okay, now I would like to welcome to the stage Seth. He is, the, he is uh, officially winning the, the award of the first pitch that we got in for 2017 for this theme when we announced that we had Badass as our opening theme. He came and he said, I really want to talk about the warrior women of Japan. And it's not something that I knew anything about. And I have nerded up a little bit, but he's here to, di to um, differentiate the fact from fiction and tell us the story of the Onabu Geisha, the warrior women of Japan. Please welcome Seth. All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you. All right. Let's see here. Ooh, I can't wait for this either. <laughs> so um, how many of you, just by a, a show of hands, have, um, in, in all of your badasseriness, uh, decapitated um, a uh, samurai warrior uh, from a moving horse? Show of hands. Yeah, yeah, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. Maybe, maybe Tori, but but I I I think you're all full of shit. All right. So um, that is is one of the many things that I'm going to be talking about tonight, and thank God it comes up a lot. Um, when it comes to the uh, the Onabugeisha, the Japanese warrior women. Um, and, and it's important to note that there's a difference between samurai, which is a term referring only to men, and onubugeisha, which is the phrase for women, because in Japanese you need another phrase uh, for samurai women. Anyway, arguably the second most famous of these warrior women is the warrior queen Empress Jingu. She claimed the throne of her when her husband, uh, the Emperor Chuai, died around 200 AD. And uh, the following year, she invaded Korea. Uh, her skill as a warrior was such that uh, she completed her conquest of Korea while pregnant with the future next emperor. How many of you have done that? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, her invasion was helped supposedly by a pair of divine jewels that she used to control the tides to allow the Japanese ships to... <laughs> Thank you to reach Korea. Um, the stories say that she was so skilled as a warrior that not a drop of blood was spilled and that she, uh, her son was born after several years of gestation. <laughs> I'm not a woman, but I can tell you that probably hurt. <laughs> All right. Um, and unfortunately, uh, at least for her, uh, she was removed from the official record as the 15th ruler of Japan um, and at nearly the same time, in 1881, was honored as the first woman ever featured on uh, a printed Japanese banknote, uh, a testament to the more egalitarian Shinto era of, an of ancient Japan, as opposed to the Neo-Confucius era that would happen around 800 AD. A thousand years later, the myth of the woman warrior would become a reality, albeit not a dominant one, and it would continue to appear throughout the country's medieval history up through... Mm, well, I'll let, you, I'll let you find that one out. Um, so before I talk about who those more recent Onabugeisha were, let's look at some of the challenges they faced and why they even existed in the first place. What circumstances would drive uh, a, a woman, uh, women were traditionally excluded from learning how to fight and wield weapons to take up arms against their oppressors in ancient Japan. Um, uh, Japanese women were expected to know at least a little bit of fighting for self-defense, as the following quote shows. Uh, they weren't really recognized for even that morsel of knowledge. Uh, British historian Stephen Turnbull, in his study of samurai, the samurai swordsman, points out that even Inazu Nitobe, the author of Bushido, the classic Japanese book on sword fighting, expresses both admiration and dismissal at the same time towards women fighters. And uh, as we see here, he says, uh, young girls, therefore, were trained to repress their feelings, to in indurate their nerves, to manipulate weapons, especially the long sword called the naginata, so as, not, so as to be able to hold their own against unexpected odds. 
Yet the primary motive for exercise of this martial character was not for use in the field, it was twofold, personal and domestic. A woman owning no suzerain of her own formed her own bodyguard. Uh, with her weapon, she guarded her personal sanctity with as much zeal as her husband did his masters. The domestic utility of her warlike training was in the education of her sons. Yeah. Uh, and as with many cultural changes throughout the history of the world that have seen women claim a more equal footing to men than they had before, uh, the wives of the aristocratic samurai just didn't have a choice. Uh, when the men went off to war in service of their feudal lords and leaders, women were left to protect the homestead. And uh, Natobe adds uh, in, in Bushido, Japanese women had to be tough enough to kill themselves to protect their honor. Now this is not an unfamiliar concept to us as we have heard a lot about uh, seppuku, the, rep the uh, ritual killing uh, of oneself that a samurai warrior must go through. The women, I'm sure you'll be shocked to learn, had it worse. Girls, when they reach womanhood, were presented with kaiken, which might be directed to the bosom of their assailants, or if advisable to their own. Her one weapon was always in her bosom. It was a disgrace for her not to know the proper way in which she had to perpetrate self-destruction. For example, little as she was taught in anatomy, she must know the exact spot to cut in her throat. She must know how to tie her lower limbs together with a belt so that whatever the agonies of death might be, her corpse would be found in utmost modesty with the limbs properly composed. Uh, right. Co you know, comparatively, seppuku, where you just disembowel yourself, is a lot easier. Um, so they just couldn't kill themselves. They had to be modest about it. In, uh, utterly, utterly intense. Uh, Onobugeisha were rarely encouraged to learn the tradition, to use the traditional katana uh, uh, sword. Uh, although there were exceptions that I'll get into in a moment, there they were trained in the kaiken, the dagger, uh, a longer knife about uh, 6 to 12 inches in length called the tanto, and the bow and arrow. Most famously, uh, as I mentioned, they were trained in the naginata, which was a polearm sword that allowed the wielder to keep an attacker away from, from a long distance. Um, Onubageisha schools from the Edo period of uh, 1603 to 1868 emphasized the naginata, and the weapon became synonymous with uh, women warriors. And this brings us uh, to this lady uh, here, or there, wherever you're looking, um, Tomoe Gozen. And uh, she is the most famous of the Onubageisha. Uh, who is described in the history books like so. She dexterously did handle sword and bow that she was a match for a thousand warriors and fit to meet God or devil. This warrior woman, so fierce as to be able to fight deities, uh, appears in the Heike Mono, uh, Monogatari, the tale of the Heike, which uh, you can sort of think of as like the Japanese Iliad. Uh, although it's written in prose, not verse, it's also got multiple contributors prior to uh, 1330. Uh, and it recounts the five-year war between the Minamoto and Taira clans for control of Japan at the end of the 12th century, uh, the first major war between samurai clans. And it's, it's a remarkable document because it mentions so much in detail about how the war unfolded and also how the battles themselves were composed and who fought whom and who killed whom. Uh, it's almost biblical in, in the way that it dictates uh, 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 the, the unfolding of war. Um, the Heike w is interesting because for all of its detail, it, it only mentions Tomoe uh, in a few paragraphs. It, it, it describes her uh, as the servant mistress or, or possibly the warrior wife of Minamoto Kiso Yoshinaka. The text varies. Uh, she was a fearless rider, uh, it, it says, who had won matchless renown, basically by kicking the shit out of the bravest captains who faced her. Um, kicking the shit is in the text. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, her story in the Heike ends with Kiso's forces completely decimated. She's one, of the la she's one of the last seven warriors left on the losing side at the Battle of Awazu. Kiso tells her to run off, as he's decided he wants to die, either by the hand of my enemy or mine own, and he would be shamed if he were to die alongside a woman, no matter how powerful her martial skills. Tomoe, uh, as we've heard uh, f you know, from other women uh, this evening, um, tells him to go get fucked. <laughs> and, and, and she wants him to, uh, to see how proud her warrior's death will be. 
and she waits with him. Uh, Ondo no Hachiro Moroshige of Musashi, a strong and valiant samurai, rides up with 30 followers almost immediately thereafter. I'm going to go a little bit over. Okay. Uh, Tomoe heads straight for Onda, grapples with him, drags him from his horse, pushes his head against the pommel of her saddle while she's still on her horse, and cuts off his motherfucking head. Now, that's a major coup and honor in Japanese warrior culture, and it's an honor for, for the victor, anyway. Um, uh, Tomei tries to escape, but is captured by Wada Yoshinori, who turns her into a concubine. She bears him a son. That son is killed when the entire Wada clan is wiped out about two decades later. After that, Tomoe becomes a nun and avoids both gods and devils until she turns 91. Um, and here's the kicker. Un just like Empress Jingu, there is no other historical evidence that Tomoe actually existed. Um, but Tomoe's inclusion in the Heke ensures that she's going to have a place in the history books and the tale of the Ono Bugeisha endures. Um, her existence is unusual because she's the only Ono Bugeisha of the era to exist in an actual war account. There's even less detail on other w women warriors from that era. Uh, Hangaku Gozen. Uh, Gozen is, is a, um, uh, a, a formal term for a, a woman of high rank. Uh, Hangaku of the Zhou family, a commander also renowned for her skill and beauty, who led 3,000 men to defend uh, t uh, <laughs> hold on, uh, Toriskayama Castle uh, against 10,000 Kamakura warriors in 1201. Accounts differ. Again, uh, basically, she was wounded, impressed the hell out of the generals who were opposed to her, and one of them took her as a wife. Was it consensual? Was it coerced? We don't know. Uh, this is a this is a picture of Tomoe Gozen uh, decapitating a a, a a warrior on a horse. Um, it's important to to mention also uh, Hojo Masoko, the nun shogun. Uh, she was the wife of the first shogun Minamoto uh, Yoritomo. She defied her father's wishes to marry him, uh, basically running away and saying, "This one's mine." Um, and when he died in 1199, she took over. Uh, as per tradition, she entered the monastery after his death and relinquished none of her power. Uh, <laughs> however, she also never raised a sword to defeat an enemy. She instead used her bully pulpit to force the samurai clan leaders to stand by the shogunate. Um, under, the, uh, under the rule of law of her family, women actually had more rights uh, by law in Japan than they, than they had had since the uh, Shinto era. Women had equal rights of inheritance with their brothers, controlled household expenses, and were expected to raise their children in samurai ideals, um, such as contempt for death and unquestioning loyalty to their lord. Uh, and that's according to historian and martial artist Harry Cook. Uh, by the 17th century, women's roles had been reduced even further, however. Um, Cook notes that few that th there were new words around this time for wife, uh, kanai and okusan, uh, which translate as uh, persons in the innermost recesses of the house. It's not a very nice way to talk about somebody that you're married to, uh, at least by modern standards. Um, and one book from the era on the kunoichi, the female ninja, described uh, their role, their main role. Uh, as espionage such as uh, eavesdropping on conversations, building a false sense of trust in targeted enemies, and finding service jobs in the homes of those enemies. Um, but no, uh, uh, not a lot of, uh, of uh, fighting on the field. At the same time, a cult of homosexuality had developed among some samurai men, and a book was published extolling the virtues of hot gay warrior sex. <laughs> Which I'm sure some of us are very uh, 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 enthusiastic about, but it also wrote, and, th and this again, this is the important part, a woman is a creature of absolutely no importance. So, <laughs> who said yes? What, 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 you haven't had, oh, of course you did. Yeah, I know you're weird. All right. So, from then up until the Meiji Restoration of 1867, the history books often only mention women in order to note their matrimonial suicides. Um, yet at the end of the close of the samurai era, women warriors are again going to force themselves onto the Japanese consciousness, and this time for good, and this time we've got evidence. Um, they just wouldn't go without a fight. In 1868, the emperor was restored to power. Uh, as you might imagine, this did not sit well with the ruling shogunate, and uh, 3,000 samurai of the Aizu clan defended uh, Aizu Wakamatsu Castle in the north of Japan, 
against around 20,000 newly minted Imperial soldiers. Um, you can think of this as Star Wars. <laughs> around 3,000 men were, 20 to th uh, uh, were accompanied by 20 to 30 women who had received extensive training with the Naginata. Uh, uh, the British historian Turnbull calls them the most authentic women warriors in the whole of Japanese history. They were led by a woman named Nakano Takeko. They fought with swords against guns. Uh, how does that end? Bad. It ends very bad. Um, and it ends even worse this time. Uh, because of Jap Japanese traditions concerning honor and defeat, many non-combatants killed themselves or had their warrior sisters and brothers kill them before facing death and battle themselves. Um, one wife of a magistrate that Turnbull uh, discovered cut her waist length hair to shoulder length for the fight, a, a more masculine style, then decapitated her mother-in-law and daughter, something that we've probably all wanted to do. Um, <laughs> and then Turnbull writes, uh, quote, death in battle, naginata in hand, drenched in blood she sought. So when the Imperials realized they were facing women, they held their fire in order to capture them alive, probably to rape the hell out of them. Uh, led by Nakano, they, press, they pressed their advantage and they killed as many as they could. Nakano killed five or six before the Imperials took up their guns and shot her in the chest. And before dying, she convinced her sister, uh, Yuko, to decapitate her to avoid a, graceful, uh, to avoid a disgraceful capture. Um, and later, a shrine would be erected in her honor at a nearby temple. Uh, so, uh, why on earth am I talking about a history of women warriors that, for many of them, probably didn't exist, may not have existed at all? Uh, Turnbull, in his survey of uh, the Onabugeisha called Samurai Women, 1184 to 1877, wrote about DNA testing on a battlefield remains uh, that, that, that involved around 105 bodies uh, from a battle in 1580. Uh, one third of those DNA belong to women. A quote from the same book sums it up. The archaeological evidence, meager though it is, tantalizingly suggests a wider female involvement in battle than is implied by written accounts alone. Can't always trust the book. So, for inspiring women to pick up their swords for two millennia, let's raise a glass to the Onobugeisha. So I forgot to start with uh, with Seth's badass accomplishment. So um, I, I have a sneaking suspicion that this connection has a little bit to do with why he ended up talking about this. But his badass moment was that when he was in Okinawa, he fought and, and lost in a karate tournament. But then he returned and tested and earned his fourth degree black belt. So a little bit of a little bit of badassery there for you. Um, so I'm going to go through a few more. This is our, our last batch before I turn over the microphone to our final speaker. Um, I have, I chased five Aryan skinheads away after they stabbed a friend. But, but I didn't realize that only three of us gave chase, and so we stopped after a block. <laughs> Um, while I was conducting reptile surveys in a locked canyon, locked canyon, in, in a national park in the middle of the night, I was stalked by a mountain lion about one mile away from the entrance. Coming face to face with her, we stared at each other for a few moments, a couple of yards away from each other. Eventually, I scared her off with my, with my snake tongs. <laughs> And hiked back out. Um, I found out later from some park rangers that she was a mom. I'm really glad that I didn't run into her cubs. That's actually really amazing. Um, and then uh, I, I jumped from the back of one speeding vehicle to another because Burning Man. I yeah. feel like... <laughs> I know all of you. Um, Okay, I would like to introduce my, my last speaker of the evening. I'd like to invite uh, Casey Selden to the stage. She first came to us and she brought a badass to the stage that is of mine own heart. She originally talked on the, our stage about Frischoff Nansen, who was fucking amazing and looks amazing in his gigantic pelt jacket. And tonight she's going to talk to us about Joseph Boulogne, uh, the Chevalier de Saint-Georges, which I might almost be getting right in French. Uh, gentlemen badass, please welcome Casey to the stage. Hello, Adlings. 
So we're going to start right here in the middle of the story with this amazing picture. So as you can see, fencing battle. Um, the guy with the top hat, that is the Prince of Wales, Britain's future King George IV, who's there in the audience to watch this showdown go down. As you can see, there's one lady with the rapier. Her name is Madame Blanchard, and it turns out that um, this is a battle that is the first thing that comes up when you search fencing in the 1700s. <laughs> and it was so popular that from the one drawing, many, many copies were made. Everybody had wanted to have a picture of this in their parlor. And one of the people who was in that battle was not a lady. She was a transvestite, exiled French spy. <laughs> and she's not who I'm talking about tonight. <laughs> so... Who could be more sexy and adventurous and amazing than that character, who definitely should earn an Absalon talk at another point? Our uh, fellow on the other side is Chevalier Saint-Georges, and we're going to start with his born name, Joseph Boulogne. Uh, he was born in the Americas. His dad got in a drunken duel with some more rapiers and murdered a man, and so instead of facing court, decided that was a great time to go back to France, where he was from. Okay, a few cocktails have been had, I understand. <laughs> so Joseph Malone turns three at sea. He ends up in um, Bordeaux and grows up there, and his father manages through some like connections with the royal court to get a royal pardon from the king. Not only that, he also gets a position in the king's bed changer, bedchamber. So basically, because he's helping the king put on his underpants in the morning, the family is on the road for an aristocratic path, and so that means our man Joseph needs to go to a fancy pants school. So when Joseph Ballone turns 13, he's enrolled in Le Boissier's Academy of Fencing and Horsemanship, which is basically like a stepping stone path to being a fancy pants person in Paris at the time. <laughs> now, um, I'm pretty sure that this is what your class schedule looks like in the 1750s in France. Uh, the class schedule was pretty heavy on important things that you need to know if you're going to be part of the aristocracy. So in the morning, you study mathematics and history and foreign languages and music and drawing and dancing. The afternoon is reserved for the most important subject, yeah. fencing. Yeah. And this isn't like when your drama teacher or your ballet instructor said this is the most important thing. It really was a, a very... Um, crucial step to becoming part of the aristocracy because in France in the 1700s, people who were not empowered didn't get pointy things. So if you wanted to be part of the power structure, you needed to have the skills of fencing, and um, that was why the school was named as such. You also learned horsemanship, which they did in the Tuileries, because this was a fancy pants schools, guys. And Joseph Ballone enters at 13. By 15, he's already kicking so much ass that he's beating his teachers in fencing duels. In, at 17, he's described as having the greatest speed imaginable, slicing and stabbing with a cool Zorro-style rapier and beating ass pretty much every time. Uh, so much so that... Um, well, so much so that <laughs> um, that he becomes known in a time when sword fighting is still your primary weapon for being pretty much the best of any 17-year-old that's ever been. It's kind of like being the starting striker in Real Madrid and... When he's not fencing and learning to dance and doing mathematics, he's got some hobbies. So according to the histories, he could often be swimming, seen swimming across the Seine with only one arm. <laughs> In skating skills, he exceeded everybody else. As to the pistol, he rarely missed a target. In running, he was reputed to be one of the leading exponents in the whole of Europe. And in addition to his skills and his athlete, St. George was also an excellent dancer. <laughs> hobbies. But again, back to fencing, this was hell of important. He was hell of good. So back when he was 15, he was so well renowned for his fencing skills that a fencing master from a rival school starts throwing shade on Boulogne because he's heard all this stuff about how good he is and challenges this kid to a duel. So um, a whole bunch of people show up for this duel 
Uh, the head fencing instructor loses the match to this 15-year-old and is so impressed that he puts Balone's picture on the wall of his fencing academy next to his swords. <laughs> next up, a guy named Gian Faldoni shows up from Italy and says, I want to fight this kid. It's a year later, so he's all of 16. And he's traveled across Europe to be able to meet this man in a duel. And Balone says, no, I'm busy swimming this in and <laughs> taking classes. No, thank you. And so what Valdoni does is basically become the Oprah of fencing. It's like, you get a duel, and you get a duel, and you get a duel. And um, fights pretty much every fencer in all of Paris until Valone decides that he can go ahead and have this battle. So all kinds of important fancy pants people show up. And it's a very close match. But Valdoni, the Italian, this time he wins. This is the only recorded defeat that Bologna ever has as an entire fencing career. And Faldoni is so impressed, he calls St. George the finest swordsman in Europe. He's not yet St. George, though. That doesn't come until he's 17, when he purchases a royal title, the officer of the Cavalier, advisor to the king, controller, ordinary of wars. And I want to mention that there was a minimum age for this job of 25. <laughs> But a waiver was granted because Bologna was so fucking good. Next up, he gets a job as the officer of the King's Guard. Now he's 18. He's Jamie Lannister of Paris. <laughs> and this really important job only requires three months of service a year, so he can keep going to school. So... <laughs> He's been in Fencing Academy for six years. At the age of 19, he's already called Le Chevalier, or basically he's been named a knight, even though there's kind of, it's questionable about whether or not that's really legal. People call him that anyway, so let's go for it. <laughs> At 19, he graduates, and now it's his coming out party. He is invited to the frothy upper classes of French society, dances in glittery ballrooms using all his dancing prowess. He converses in delicately appointed parlors, attend shows in opulent concert halls. He's rumored to frequent a number of ladies' boudoirs. <laughs> and let's be real, who could blame them? <laughs> He's handsome, athletic, well-connected, and of course, there's his music too, which I haven't mentioned. <laughs> but this is pretty accurate. So in an insanely awesome turn of events, all of a sudden, in 1764, when this kid is 19, he starts playing insane violin jams that blow everyone's faces off and <laughs> send them flying to the back of auditoriums around Paris. And before this point in time, nobody had any idea he could play. There's no record of him having any training ever played before. Apparently, he was too busy skating and shooting and running, and everybody knew about that. But this comes out of nowhere, and this guy fucking shreds. Not only that, but he also starts composing music. Um, if you know how to read music, you will know that all these little dots mean that's a lot of notes to fit into one page. <laughs> and this is the kind of shit that he writes. On top of that, he dresses in insane, cutting-edge, silver-trimmed courtier clothes, jams a bunch of badass songs that he extemporizes, playing his violin solos, and also was appreciated not as much for his composing as for his performances, enrapturing especially the feminine members of his audience. <laughs> okay, so he writes string quartets, concertos, sonatas, a bunch of other words that basically all mean badass classical jam, and then he bangs a bunch of croupies, and contemporary accounts speak of these romantic conquests. It made it into history. The young Chevalier becomes one of the darlings of fashionable society, and on more than one occasion, Queen Marie Antoinette herself was disguised as a regular noblewoman so she could go check out these shows, and later on in his career, he even played a string quartet with her. So, basically, this guy's a superstar in France. His performances in the sword, with the violin, with that other baton that he has. <laughs> When he's not serving in the Kingsguard, he's writing operas, managing concert halls, even commissioning new works from famous contemporary artists like Joseph Haydn. He's declared as having the best orchestra for symphonies in Paris and perhaps even Europe. 
by the musical almanac in 1775. And so it makes sense that he is, um, his name is put in for the most important prestigious musical post in France, which is the head of the Royal Opera for Louis XVI. But this is prevented by some Parisian divas. I'm not throwing shade here. They literally sang in the opera. They were called divas. <laughs> And they petitioned the queen in writing against this appointment, insisting that it would be beneath their dignity and injurious to their professional reputation to sing on a stage under the direction of a mulatto. And that put an end to any aspirations saint Georges may have had in becoming musical director for that great institution. This was, as far as we know, the most serious setback yet he'd suffered because of his color. Oh yeah, that's right, I haven't mentioned that this man, Le Chevalier de Saint-Georges, was a mixed-race man. He had brown skin and suffered all of the challenges that come with that. And every article that I read about this man started the article with that fact. But I didn't want to do that to my story because I feel like it cheapens it a little. Like, he was black and he knew how to play the violin or... He was pretty good at fencing for a black man. Um, I, don't, I don't like that approach. I feel like he, this man did so much, his accomplishments speak for themselves, and then they speak more so with the fact that he had to do that facing overt and systemic racism. Because his father, I know, right? So his father was living in the Americas in Guadeloupe, and his mother was a pretty 17-year-old woman from Africa who was a slave at his plantation and gave birth to Joseph Malone on Christmas Day, 1745. So he was a son of a slave who showed up in Paris with a different color skin than everybody else, and because of his African descent, he was basically forbidden by French law for participating in anything cool or exciting. His African heritage made him ineligible for nobility. All those titles that he was called by, that's not allowed to him. Racial attitudes made it impossible for him to marry anyone at his level of society. But this guy rarely seemed to give a shit about anyone else's <laughs> expectations of him and refused to let these motherfuckers step on him or talk shit because of his heritage. He just went ahead and did what he wanted to do and he was so fucking good at it that nobody could slow him down. And so this son of a slave remarkably um, makes it in French society through his mastery of all these different things in a period of time where slavery is legal in parts of the world. Nothing can really get in his way except for fucking history. Because even in his time, he's billed as Le Mozart Noir which is a little bit nicer than the black Mozart, but not by much. This man doesn't even get his own name sometimes when he's billed alongside of Mozart. And Mozart, at the period when St. George's musical career was at his peak, was still scouring Europe for steady work. They were um, contemporaries in a way, but St. George was the man who brought the idea of the violin quartet to Paris. He was really instrumental in, um, in his era in in his own work and didn't need Mozart to prop him up. Uh, he fights in the French Revolution. He runs an all-black um, fighting force. He is falsely imprisoned for 18 months. He probably traveled back to Guadeloupe where there are palm fronts and uh, sees the slave rebellion that's going on there and makes it back to Paris in time for the end of his days dies at 53, and he's still famous there, so there's a bunch of um, commemorative editions of his work that appear in France, but after his death, Napoleon Bonaparte is in power, slavery is um, reimposed, and St. George and his music were removed from orchestra repertoires, and especially from history books, not to be rediscovered for more than 200 years. There's only about a third of his compositions that have survived the last two hundred years, but those that we have are certainly on par with the works of white Mozart and white Hayden, <laughs> white Chevalier St. George. All these other composers get their own names, so let's exit by giving this man his proper due and listening to some of his works with a matan. Yeah. Steam? <laughs>
got a homework project, ladies and gentlemen, because Le Chevalier St. George is not the only one who maybe has not gotten his due because of his talents for the fact that he may have a different color skin than um, the, the powers that be. So I encourage you to go home and check out his work, check out the work of somebody else. I feel like this man definitely deserves to be honored on this stage. And though he won many honors in his lifetime, I would like to award him a special honor here as the gentleman badass that he is. I feel like the order of the Wolpertinger should be a thing uh, that this man definitely is deserving of. And if you'd like to join our man on this honorable guild, just step up to the merch table over there, get yourself a medal. We've got some new pins for the new season. And um, it is one way to honor the incredible achievements of everybody who we've talked about on the stage tonight. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Casey. That was awesome. Um, I have one final badass note from Casey, who was, in addition to uh, an amazing teller of tales and a, and a leader of stories on both the stars and dinosaurs in her other life, she has also led backcountry rock climbing tours and, and caving trips. Yeah. She took the Trans-Siberian Railroad by herself, which is on my, my bucket list for sure. And I feel like this might be the most impressive. She drove a tuk-tuk in India, <laughs> which, yeah, okay. So um, that wraps up our talks for this evening. I wanna remind everyone that we'd love to hear your stories. And so we are just beginning a new season. We have an entire year of salons. We also have an exciting new partnership. We're working with the Maritime Heritage Research Library. Um, full of ships, oh my God. I'm gonna derail myself for one second. We went and we saw their archives. We met with their librarians and archivists and they opened up their collections. It is an extraordinary resource that is owned by the National Parks. It's the largest maritime library on the West Coast. It's the largest collection of, of, of its kind owned by National Parks. And it's open to the public and no one knows it's there. It's at Fort Mason in building E, I think. And it's absolutely extraordinary. And we're gonna be working with them over the course of this year to bring some more ship stories to our stage and to bring more of you to see their collections because they're amazing. Um, so um, please, um, if you haven't already uh, added your name to our speakers list, you can do it online or you can do it over at the table. We would love to hear from you. We want to have all kinds of diverse stories on this stage. So um, give us your ideas. Coming up next, we have um, stories in two weeks back here at Public Works. We're going to have stories of ancient wonders and sideshow spectacles, masterpieces of modern engineering and terrifying mythical beasts, the miracle of moving type and eccentric collectors of curiosities. Odslan Marvel is coming up on Tuesday, March 21st, followed by Odslan Crisis on April 4th and Creature on April 18th. Crisis and Creature are still open for stories, so if you have ideas, please feel free to add your ideas to those stories. And we have discounted tickets available for all of those over at the table and now we're going to play a little bit more of Joseph Ballone's work and have another cocktail and we hope to see you between now and our next salon join us online we have a, an online discussion group on Facebook I feel like we're trying to use Facebook to good ends <laughs> um, it's called something weird and that's where our speakers are there and we'll be fo posting our follow-up reading and links related to tonight's stories and we welcome you to join us add your own badass stories or stories that from history that you found that you think are really great and let's all just join the conversation there um, the bar is open Please stay, chat, mingle, bug the speakers, ask all your questions, and thank you for coming out tonight. <laughs> Cheers and good night. <laughs>